Arsenal versus Tottenham, one of the Premier League's most heated rivalries, dividing the north of London, but with roots in the south. Hey there, I'm Adrian, and welcome to Rabona TV's Roots of the Rivalry, the series where we take a look at the shared history of the two clubs involved, the initial reason as to why they dislike each other, and sprinkle in a few more reasons for discontent along the way. It goes without saying, but this isn't a recounting of every single event that's occurred between these two teams, just the more important ones that explain the division or at least contribute to it. All right, let's look at how the two teams came to be, starting back in 1882 with Tottenham Hotspur FC. Apologies for the rhyme there. Well, actually, when they were founded by some members of the Hotspur Cricket Club, they were simply known as Hotspur FC. Like many other clubs in England, the football team was formed in order for the members to have a sport to play in the winter while the conditions for cricket weren't ideal. Later on, the founding members, led by Bobby Buckle, called upon John Ripshire from All Hallows Church to be the president of the club and help to develop it into a legitimate football club for the community. However, given that there was already a club called London Hotspur FC, they changed their name to Tottenham Hotspur FC in 1884. One year later, in 1885, Spurs played their first competitive match against St. Albans, whom they smashed 5-2, wearing their then club colours of light blue and white. In fact, Tottenham changed their club colours quite frequently, at one point playing in red and navy, then in yellow and brown, and finally, in 1898, they switched to white shirts and navy shorts. Now, Spurs moved to their present day home in 1899, and though they played with the idea of calling it Gilpin Park or Percy Park, the ground was referred to as White Hart Lane. Some say the name was chosen due to White Hart Lane, the street, running along the west of the stadium, while some believe that it was referred to White Hart Lane due to a local pub called White Hart Pub, being the local meetup for Spurs fans before their matches. But back to their competitive history, as Spurs won their first FA Cup in 1901. It's important to note that at this point, Spurs were still a non-league club. They hadn't been admitted into the Football League. That wouldn't come until 1908. But in 1901, Spurs became the first and only non-league club in the history of the FA Cup to win the trophy, beating Sheffield United 3-1 in a replay. As I just mentioned, in 1908, Spurs were officially part of the Football League, starting in the second division and gaining promotion immediately as champions in the 1908-09 season. I think this is actually a good place to pause on Spurs for a second, as now we have to leave North London to see where and when Arsenal was founded. In October of 1886, a Scotsman named David Danskin wanted to form a football club with some of his friends from the Woolwich Arsenal Armament Factory in Woolwich, London, which is on the southern bank of the River Thames. With the arrival of a couple of former Nottingham Forest players to the factory, Danskin and 15 others all pitched in to buy a football. They temporarily referred to themselves as Dial Square, the name of one of the workshops at the Woolwich Arsenal, and won their first ever match against Eastern Wanderers 6 0 in a friendly. By the way, for those who were previously unfamiliar with Arsenal's foundational history, the cannon on their club badge and, well, their name in general makes more sense now, no? Following their victory over Eastern Wanderers, while sitting at the Royal Oak Pub on December 25th, 1886, Danskin and co decided to call themselves Royal Arsenal, a name that combined their meeting place, the Royal Oak Pub, with their place of work, the Arsenal. And it's here where the first North London Derby occurred, except at the time, it wasn't a North London Derby at all, but a friendly meeting between Tottenham Hotspur FC and Royal Arsenal in 1887. Spurs were leading 2-1, but the match was abandoned due to the loss of light. Remember, floodlights were scarce back then, and the first permanent floodlights at a stadium didn't come around until 1950 when the Dell, Southampton's former home, became the first stadium in England to have them installed permanently. They still needed to sort out kits, so the two club members that formerly played for Nottingham Forest that I mentioned contacted their old club to ask if they had some kits they could spare. Forest kindly agreed and sent red kits to the newly formed Royal Arsenal, who, by the way, changed their name to Woolwich Arsenal in 1893. The club then became the first London-based team to turn professional and were included in the Football League's second division, where they would stay until 1904 when they secured promotion. Five years later, they meet with Tottenham Hotspur FC in their first ever competitive match together, which Arsenal won 1-0. Unfortunately for them, hard times would hit Arsenal financially, bankrupting the club in 1910, though it was saved by two local businessmen named Henry Norris and William Hall. But they couldn't save them from relegation in 1913. And it was here that the rivalry truly began, as Norris and Hall decided to move the club from Woolwich and settled upon North London, most notably Highbury, Arsenal's historic former ground, which was just four miles from White Hart Lane. 
Tottenham were, of course, unhappy about the invasion of their territory. They were livid with Arsenal FC, who had dropped Woolwich from their name in 1915, by the way. Even now, you'll hear some Tottenham fans mentioning how Arsenal aren't even a North London club and they should go back to Woolwich where they belong. And this, in essence, is the main factor as to why Spurs started to hate Arsenal. The simple fact that they even exist within North London when they aren't even from there in the first place. I'll expand on this a little bit later, but let's continue with some of their shared history first. If Spurs were unhappy with the foreign invaders from Woolwich then, they were extremely unhappy with them in 1919 once the First Division returned to action following the First World War. So, in the 1914-15 season, Arsenal was playing in the Second Division and finished 6th, while Spurs were in the First Division and finished dead last. Back then, promotion relegation was just two up and two down. However, following the war, the first division was to be expanded by two teams, which bore the question, do the bottom two from the 1914-15 season get to stay up, those two teams being Chelsea and Spurs? If you'd asked Spurs, then yes, they should have been allowed to do so, but it went to a vote. Chelsea were voted to stay up in the first division, despite finishing just one spot above them, as I said, as the belief was that Liverpool and Manchester United actually fixed a match on the final day of the season in order to assure that the Mancunians would remain in the first division and send Chelsea down to the second division. The other team that was voted to take the final spot in the first division? Arsenal, despite finishing in sixth in the second division, as you'll remember. Now, the reason as to why Arsenal were voted to stay up could be seen as simple or murky, depending on who you ask. If you'd ask Spurs fans at the time, they would say that Arsenal chairman Henry Norris used his influence to get the other members to vote for his club. Some say he used some shady tactics as well. But Arsenal fans, and quite frankly many news outlets at the time, pointed to the fact that Arsenal had been part of the first division for such a long time, and they showed great loyalty to the league, and that was the reason as to why they were chosen over the likes of Tottenham. Either way, Tottenham won the second division, and the stage was set for our first true North London Derby. And this is when the passionate, fiery, sometimes toxic, and sometimes violent nature of the North London Derby really came into its own. After feeling as though they were dealt an injustice and being sent to the second division, Spurs came back up with a vengeance. And one season later, on January 15th, 1921 at White Hart Lane, Spurs defeated the Arsenal 2-1. From here on out, there was nothing but bad blood between the sides. That is, until the Second World War came around. Now this sort of goes against the whole point of this video series as this next bit brought the clubs together just a little bit, but it's an interesting piece of trivia, so let's talk about it anyway. With the Second World War going on, Highbury Stadium was actually used as an air raid precaution stronghold and was in fact bombed with the south bank of the stadium being completely destroyed. So, during this time, football did actually continue in the country, though not via the English Football League First Division, so Arsenal was forced to play all of their matches at White Hart Lane, 133 matches total. The fans, of course, didn't like each other, but when your country is embroiled in a war and your city is getting bombed by the Germans, it puts things into perspective, as the likes of Ancelotti and Arrigo Sacchi and even Pope John Paul II have echoed, quote, of all the unimportant things in life, football is the most important, end quote. And I think that sums up the situation pretty well here. Yeah, we hate each other on a footballing level, but we're all part of this country and we can put our rivalry aside. For now. Because... Following the war, they went right back to hating each other. From here on out, pretty much every clash between the sides was full-blooded. So let's go over a few of the matches and events that contributed to the ire and the bantering back and forth between these two clubs. First off, there's May 3rd, 1971, the final day of the first division season. Leeds United had already played their final match two days earlier, having defeated Nottingham Forest 2-0, and were at the top of the table. So the equation was simple. If Arsenal win their final match, they'll win their eighth first division title. Who are they playing? Spurs, of course. Where are they playing? At White Hart Lane. Tottenham striker Martin Chivers was on a tear that season, finishing behind only West Brom's Tony Brown in the scoring standings, and would love nothing more than to defy the rivals of the title. Well, unfortunately for Chivers, Spurs and all of their fans, it was another prolific striker in Arsenal's Ray Kennedy who would conquer the day, giving Arsenal a 1-0 win at White Hart Lane and the first division title. The match winner, the championship winner. Now, that wouldn't be the only time that Arsenal would secure a league title at White Hart Lane, as they also managed to do so in 2004. Already just saying, 
Arsenal plus 2004 should send your brain to one thing and one thing only, their invincible season. On the 25th of April 2004, Arsenal were almost a sure thing to win the title already. It was just a matter of when they would do it and if they would retain their unbeaten status for the season. And in the end, they held on for a 2-2 draw and got the point that they needed in the home of their rivals for the second time, 33 years after the first instance. And no, the Arsenal fans would never let the Spurs faithful forget it. The worst part? One of the players in Arsenal's back line, which leads us to our next bit of banter. The year is 2001, and Arsene Wenger calls a press conference, entering with his classic smirk when he has something up his sleeve, saying that he had someone to introduce to the media. And he introduced Saul Campbell, a complete blindside for not only Spurs fans, but Arsenal fans, and to be fair, to English football fans in general, as there was absolutely no rumblings that the England international would trade North London clubs. No media leaks, no rumors prior to unveiling, nothing. Salzir Jeremiah Campbell, a Spurs general who turned down a contract that would have made him Spurs' most highly paid player ever at the time. You know, people always talk about how Luis Figo going from Barcelona to Real Madrid is one of the biggest acts of treachery in football. And it is. But Campbell is arguably a far more treacherous case in the eyes of English football fans, most notably Spurs fans, given the fact that he was a product of the Spurs academy and went on to captain the side. It would be like if Messi went to Real Madrid. Maybe not Messi, at least not on f footballing ability, but you know what I'm saying. And the reason for choosing Arsenal hurt the Spurs fans even more. Quote, David Dean made me feel protected. He was going to help and promise to be there for me. Come to us, he said, and you will be part of our family. We will protect you. End quote. Part of our family, straight up trading the family you were born into, despite him starting his youth career at West Ham, of course, trading the team that made him for their most bitter rivals. When Arsenal next visited White Hart Lane, the Spurs faithful had balloons with the word Judas for the returning center back. Hell, even Campbell's brother, Tony, didn't support his younger brother after the move. He was spotted in the stands, chanting along with the rest of them. Even worse, Spurs fans then had to watch as Campbell went on to win two league titles, something Spurs hadn't done and still haven't done since 1961 and two FA Cups. Of course, this built up the animosity between the two sets of supporters even more, with Arsenal fans boasting about how even a Spurs youth player that went on to captain the side would rather wear the red of their North London rivals. That said, Spurs have gotten the better of Arsenal on a few notable occasions, most of which coming in cup competitions. For example, there's the 2008 League Cup semi-final in which Spurs defeated Arsenal 5-1, the first time that Spurs had beaten Arsenal since 1999 as Spurs went on to win the League Cup. The most famous victory for Spurs fans was the 1991 FA Cup semi-final in which Spurs, led by Gary Lineker and Paul Gascoigne, defeated Arsenal 3-1 at Wembley Stadium on April 14th, a special date for Spurs fans, which some refer to as St. Hotspur Day. Arsenal have a Saint Day of their own that I'll get to in a moment. During the 90s, it was a bit of a one-sided rivalry as Arsenal were leaps ahead of Spurs in regards to results. But as their rivals improved in the mid-2000s, Arsenal were forced to become more aware of Spurs and saw them as a genuine threat at times, leading to the reinvigoration of the London Derby, not only on a fan culture level, but at a sporting level as well. It made the rivalry less one-sided. Suddenly, Spurs were less of a banter club, though some of their the Arsenal fans were loath to admit it. Their reasoning? St. Totteringham's Day. Started in 2002, St. Totteringham's Day is sort of like Easter in that it doesn't have a specific date associated with it. Instead, St. Totteringham's Day falls on the day that it is mathematically impossible for Spurs to finish above Arsenal in the Premier League standings. For two seasons in a row, however, Spurs have finished above Arsenal. St. Totteringham's Day cancelled. So, there you have it. To sum things up, the first sort of point of contention or the root of the rivalry, so to speak, between these two clubs. Ugh, cringy saying the title. <laughs> but it was of course the fact that Arsenal moved in on Tottenham's territory. Unlike other derbies, this isn't a class division or a religious division. As time went on, the invaders were undoubtedly the more successful club, which led to a bit of a lopsided rivalry in that, while they both hated each other, Arsenal have always been able to boast more titles and more derby wins to their name thus not having to worry so much about the rivals and their adopted home of North London. 
Thanks for watching and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, then a like is always appreciated. And if you're new and want to join our growing community for all sorts of content, including live streams, etc., then just hit that subscribe button. It's free. Once again, my name's Adrian, this is Arona TV, and enjoy the Derby.